Hey everyone, I'm Melissa from Knitting the Stash, and this is episode 104 in the series. This one is all about sweaters and single ply yarns. And yes, single ply is kind of like an oxymoron or something, right? It's a little weird. We'll get to that. Uh, but welcome to the yarn room, and I'm so happy to be hanging out with you guys on this Sunday morning. We have been in a week week, week and a half of rain and shat, like thunderstorms and just crazy kind of stuff just blowing through. So it's been a little wild and it's kind of getting a little murky out there again. So we'll see how this all goes. Welcome back. If you're coming back for the 104th episode <laughs> or any number in between, uh, it's so nice to see you here. And I love uh, all of your comments and your emails and your correspondence. It's just so wonderful in between these episodes to get a chance to chat with you guys in the YouTube comments and over email and on Ravelry. So please keep it coming and just know that if I haven't gotten back to your message yet, I will. It's lovely to hear from you. And if you're new, welcome. This is a podcast mostly about uh, garment design and modification and lots and lots of sweaters usually. <laughs> but we also talk about shawls and yarn construction and what to do with your yarn. And that's kind of one of the things we're going to talk about today. For those of you who have been wondering, the sheep are back. Uh, they We have six this season to, uh, on, we call it sheep summer camp out on the back pasture. So they're really adorable. This is some of the sweetest sheep uh, we've, we've always had really good groups of sheep out there, thanks to Kathy at Seven Sisters Farm, uh, basically lending us her sheep. <laughs> uh, some years we've had yearlings, uh, some years we've had moms. This year we happen to have a lot of moms who are being weaned from their babies, so uh, Kathy said it was a little easier to have the uh, sheep come out, the moms come out here and have a separate pasture and be away from the babies and give them a little bit of time off. So it is a little bit like a, it's a spa retreat or a summer camp for moms this year, which is kind of nice to think about. Uh, we've, we've only had one hoof problem so far, no utter massage. So, <laughs> and if you're looking for the utter massage episode, it's a few, it's a few episodes back, back last summer, I was massaging the udders of a bunch of sheep. So yeah, sheep. It's fun. It's fun to have them out there. They're so quiet and they basically, um, they're naughty. They get into some trouble, but they're also just very kind of quiet and demure and just hang out out there. They follow us when we go berry picking and they chase the cats around a little bit and, you know, sheep. What are you going to do? So that's been happening in our back pasture and uh, in our front pasture, <laughs> in our house. Uh, I've, I'm still working on my special secret uh, project for you guys and I will be able to make the announcement on the next podcast so please uh, keep your eye out for that. Uh, Shorn Yarn is also going to be released next month that's kind of part of the package. Uh, I'm gonna have a new website going up. There's just a lot of really fun things happening in July around here and I'm so excited to share it with you guys but I just have to keep it under my hat for a little bit longer but I think it's worth I think it's worth the wait. So what do I have on the episode today? I have uh, an FO. This is Jakers by Isabel Kramer. Uh, we're going to talk about single ply yarn. Again, single ply. <laughs> single ply yarn and its kind of benefits and um, risks if you're using it for garments. And we're going to talk about an update on my Reverb cardigan by Tannis Lavalle of Tannis Fiber Arts. Spencer sewed the buttons on, you all saw that tutorial, so I have some photos, some finished object photos for you guys to see the actual final fit of that sweater. We talked about it in a few episodes ago. Uh, yeah, so that's basically what the episode is today, and I'm looking forward to jumping right in with you guys. So, shall we talk about finished object first, and then talk about the pros and cons of using a singles yarn? Now, one of the reasons that I'm talking about this is because I knit up Jakers in lichen and lace uh, in their uh, rustic... It's called Rustic Heather Sport. And Lichen and Lace, let's see if this will pop up there for you guys, maybe. Lichen and Lace is a Canadian yarn dyeing company run by Megan Ingman. And I am a huge fan of her yarn. I actually, she just had some free shipping and I actually bought some more of it. So I found Megan's yarn, Lichen and Lace, when I was visiting Canada for uh, a conference a couple years back and made my way over to this little yarn shop and found her yarn there. And I couldn't help it. I tried not to buy too much, but I picked up three skeins. And this is the Rustic Heather Sport in coal. Let's see, I'll go in order. This is birch over here, coal in the middle, and uh, ash on the end. And I thought to myself, that would be a perfect kind of little colorwork palette. Beautiful little thing. 
and I left it in my stash for quite a while because I just, you know, there's a lot of yarn in here and I don't always get to work with the yarn that I buy. There's, I heard someone say in my um, spinning group this past week that there's two, two actual hobbies involved here, two actual crafting things. Like one is the collection of the yarn and the other is the knitting or crafting with the yarn. So I, I totally subscribe to that. So this sat in my stash for a little while. And uh, actually, I noticed that I had subscribed to her newsletter, and I noticed that she was having uh, a, she has this great sale page with kind of one-off skeins and, and other things going on. And I picked up in that sale this gorgeous color. This is a one-off. This is a one-of-a-kind. Um, I don't even think it has a, it doesn't even have a name, but that's what I knit this sweater out of. Uh, I also picked up skeins like this guy, which is clover, beautiful. And just recently she had a sale on uh, like zero shipping and shipping from Canada. Let's all be frank, right? I mean, you don't want to pay shipping from Canada. So I jumped on that and I actually bought um, enough birch. I already had one skein, so I just needed five more. Uh, and I had this skein already. So I bought enough four or five more skeins of this and I'm going to use this one from my stash and I'm going to knit up another Isabel Kramer pattern. Um, I think it's called Nasrin. It's a beautiful um, pullover with a uh, colored uh, yoke at the top. So anyway, you're going to hear a lot more about lichen and lace. I really love Megan's um, work. I was reading about a little bit about her story. She kind of started out uh, running a yarn shop that she sold and then she kind of rebranded and came up with a new line of yarn, this lichen and lace that she was selling on um, at fiber festivals and on Etsy. And she's kind of gotten picked up um, wholesale now by I think 50 different yarn shops around the world. So you can get it you know, all the way from London to uh, Japan. Uh, so she's gotten to be a pretty popular um, and beautiful yarn dyer. Now the one thing I really love about this particular yarn, she does a lot of superwash yarn, and we've talked about superwash yarn on here before, um, but this is the um, Rustic Heather Sport, which is 100% Canadian wool, not superwashed, uh, and I really just, I, I'm, I love a good heather, and I feel like um, this yarn must be over dyed on some of the uh, kind of gray or uh, oatmeal kind of bases, that would be my guess. Um, I haven't spoken to Megan. I should probably send her an email just extolling her virtues. She doesn't even know I'm doing this episode. So this is just me telling you about um, some wonderful yarn that I found. Uh, so I decided to um, knit up a sweater in this yarn and the Isabel Kramer sweater just kind of fit the bill. Uh, now, there are a bunch of different things about using a singles yarn that we're gonna come back around and talk about because the lichen and lace um, Rustic Heather Sport is a singles yarn, and you can see that here. I'm going to pull out a little piece of it. It is a an absolute singles yarn, so there's no ply to this. There's no extra, um, you know, ply would imply you spin the yarn one direction and then you ply it in the other direction, right? So you end up with, you know, something like that. This is a single ply yarn, singles, called a singles yarn, and it's really quite tough. I mean, this is, it would take a lot to actually, it's kind of, it almost feels a little felted, like it doesn't want to come apart that easily. If you really give it a tug, you can get some of it to come apart. Um, it broke not at all when I was working on this sweater, 100% no breaks. To me, it's a pretty tough, tough little yarn, I appreciate that. So let me tell you a little bit about this sweater first, and then we'll talk more, we'll come back around to this idea of a, a singles yarn for a sweater. So uh, Jaegers just came out from Isabel Kramer, I think this past spring, if I'm remembering right. And she knitted up in a fingering weight uh, yarn that was plied. And I just saw this lace work at the top and I thought to myself, you know, lace really goes pretty well with a singles yarn because it kind of shows off the stitches. The, the yarn will um, allow lace to kind of fall open so that you can see the pattern. And I think in this light, there we go. You can see this really pretty pattern that runs all across the yoke. Um, in the lace. Now, of course, I, this yarn does have a little bit of variegation to it, and one of you guys on one of these other episodes was asking about natural 100% um, wool that is variegated, dyed in a variegated way. So I would say that this lichen and lace um, rustic heather sport is one of those yarns. So you can see that there's some really nice variegation going on and that there's um, less up here with the lace. It doesn't actually disturb the lace too much, I don't think. I think it's it's one of those trade-off choices. If you're going to use a variegated yarn, oftentimes you wouldn't necessarily do cables or lace because then you're kind of competing with yourself. But in this case, I feel like it has enough of a kind of um, 
purple color in the background to make it work. So it's a top-down sweater. Uh, you begin up here with at the collar uh, and at the neckline, and you're working um, in the round, and you're creating some extra short rows in the back here. This is an Isabel Kramer secret. She loves doing the short rows, and I love them in her patterns because it, that raises this back neck. Like you can see it on the side. You see how the back neck is raised up here higher than the front neck here. Like me and my mannequin having fun. Uh, so you have these beautiful uh, short rows in the back to lift the back neckline. And then you work the lace pattern, which is charted. And then you just work in your stockinette all the way down to a garter hem, which is interesting. You can probably barely see it there. Garter hem is one of those things that's, um, again, a little tricky because it doesn't always want to lay flat. It might want to flip up on you. This one laid flat, but I'll tell you about how I did that in a minute. Uh, and then you pick up your um, sleeves that you've left on waist yarn and you knit down to the lacy cuffs, which uh, is basically a repeat of the lace around the collar. Okay, so there's your overview. Now, what did I do? Well, <laughs> I did a lot of different things. So number one, uh, since it called for a fingering weight yarn, uh, which is about roughly like 400 yards or so per 100 grams. This yarn is actually um, 215 yards for 56 grams. So even though it's called a sport weight, it acts a lot like a fingering weight. So that's why I went with it. And if, like I showed you before, if you're looking at the actual yarn, I mean, it really does kind of register as a fingering weight yarn in a lot of respects. So I had to do a little bit of monkeying with the gauge um, to get it to work out. And in fact, this ended up... Um, knitting up to be a little, has a little more ease than I would have um, initially planned for. And that's partially because when I knit my swatch, uh, I mistakenly thought that uh, I was working in gauge when I was actually just a little bit out of gauge, I think by one stitch. And so over the course of the whole sweater, it was gonna be too big. So my lace portion is actually worked in a larger size uh, than I would have normally picked. I think it's worked in the 38 size or something like that, but I was trying to go for more of a 36 or a 35. Uh, so what I did is I ended up knitting all the way down to here, realizing the, my mistake and ripping all the way back to uh, basically where the lace ended and where I um, separated for the armholes. Yeah, ripped out, you know. Knitting is knitting. I enjoy the process, so who cares? Uh, and I, sh I decided to not cast on as many stitches in the underarm. I think she called for something like, I want to say it was like 16 stitches. It seemed like a lot. Uh, and I, so I took out four stitches here, four on the other side. Uh, so an initial eight stitch uh, lowered stitch count. And then as I got down the body, I also did reduction. So I did one here and one here, kind of at the waist. So that's another two stitches and two stitches. So another eight stitches altogether. So the body of the sweater, uh, as you get down here, ends up being 16 stitches fewer than it would have been uh, for the size that I was following. So I did do a little bit of that. I think Isabel Kramer's sweaters are very nice in that they're a lot of them aren't shaped. You know, there, there's a lot of straightness going on. So for my particular body type, that works really well. Um, this one was going to end up being straight, but being too big. So that's why I reduced it here so that the bust was a little bit smaller. And then that meant that it was smaller going down to my hips. One thing I will say about Isabel Kramer's sweaters patterns is that one of the nice things is that you, I never feel bound up at the hips. Some sweaters, you know, you put that ribbing on and there's been shaping or there's something else and it just feels like it's clinging to my hips and that I think I've told you guys before that drives me nuts. So the cool thing, one of the cool things about Isabel Kramer's patterns is that they never end up feeling that way. My two alias cardigans, which you guys have seen me wear all the time, uh, are both Isabel Kramer patterns and I love the way that they just kind of have this little bit of flow around the hips, a little bit of movement. So um, very happy with the way that that one, this one turned out the same. Um, it's really kind of funny. I knit two, two versions of Alias in two different yarns that had nothing to do with the yarn called for in the pattern and did all kinds of modification for those two sweaters. And I love them and they're the ones I wear all the time. And then for some reason, I didn't knit another Isabel Kramer sweater until now, which is so strange. So I just like her aesthetic. I always admire her patterns. They're always in my favorites in my library, but I just never came back around to knitting one of her sweaters again. What is up with that? Does that happen to anybody else or is it just me? 
Anyway, uh, so what else did I do here? Uh, I did a helical knitting thing, which I'll show you here. So because these skeins were one of a kind, uh, they're not perfectly matched up. And anytime you're using a slightly variegated yarn, it's always good to swap out skeins. So I didn't do, some people do three. I've done that before, three different skeins, you know, to make sure that the color doesn't pull really. I just did two. And you can see here, maybe, this line, which is almost like a float, where I was swapping the yarns out and um, kind of doing it as I moved across the sweater. So I wasn't always switching them in the same place, which would create a kind of a very clear line and a ladder. You uh, basically knit to the place where you want to swap your yarns. You knit a couple stitches past it, and then you, you switch over the other yarn, kind of like you're doing color work with a little float there. So I hope you can see that float that ends up running. That's why they call it helical knitting, because it's kind of like spirals down, right, as you do it. And on the front, it doesn't show at all. You wouldn't ever know that there's really the line I think runs from the armpit all the way down here and you can barely see it. I don't even know if you can see it. Yeah. Anyway, so I did do that with the skeins to kind of swap things out and I went with a shorter hem. The sweater was already feeling kind of long on me by the time I got to the hem and so I didn't do uh, multiple rows of garter. I just did a couple here and I kind of like the way that that ends. Like I, I like sweaters that don't have a big fancy ending down at the hips. They just kind of subtly go out of the world. <laughs> so uh, this worked out well. And if you have garter stitch at the bottom of a sweater, it can flip up. So uh, Isabel Kramer has a, a couple different techniques in her pattern to help you with that. Um, the other thing that helped me is uh, when I went to block the sweater, I actually really, I got the garter really, really flat and I folded a towel over on top of it and then kind of stepped on it and kept the pressure going that way. And so even just the weight of the towel on top of that helped to kind of smooth everything out. Just kind of like you would do with a, a like old fashioned posters where you'd unroll the poster or the carpet and you put something heavy on top of it to kind of keep it flat and to kind of have it flatten out. That's all I did with the hem here and it's, you can see it's laying really nice and flat. So, I think those are all the different mods I did to this sweater, aside from all the gauge work and, and things like that. Uh, it's a beautiful piece, and I'll put a few pictures of me wearing it in here so that you can see it. Uh, and yeah, I'm gonna knit the Nasrin sweater, which will be a similar construction, I think, in this same yarn. So when I do that, as you guys know from other uh, episodes, now you have a massive gauge swatch, <laughs> right? So like this gauge swatch is huge. It's gonna behave in ways that a tiny gauge swatch won't. And so I can actually measure this much more clearly for the gauge for the next sweater. And uh, if this sweater ended up just a little bit more ease than I wanted, the next sweater will end up absolutely perfect because I now have a sweater sized gauge swatch to totally work with for the next one. Uh, yeah, so this is Jakers by Isabel Kramer. Lovely uh, knit, very simple, um, but looks kind of complex and beautiful and has a nice drape to it when I wear it, especially with this singles yarn. So that leads me to the discussion of singles and single plied yarn as it's often known. So spinners will often call singles singles <laughs> and some people call it single plied yarn. Doesn't quite make sense because a plied yarn, you know, would be at least two strands kind of wrapped around each other. So let's talk about some of the um, assumptions maybe that we might come to singles yarn with and try to dispel some of those myths. And basically the overarching uh, take home message here is that whatever assumptions we have about a certain kind of yarn, whether it's a singles or a worsted or a woolen or a three ply or whatever it is, you can never really generalize across the board about any particular yarn uh, because when you take that yarn and you apply it to a particular project, the synergy of those two things is gonna create something new. So you have to think about all the diff these different factors when you go about kind of choosing a yarn for a garment, um, like a sweater. So let's talk about assumption number one. A singles yarn is going to break on you, that it's gonna be a problem to knit with, it's not gonna be very strong, and that it's going to lead to a lot of potential mending um, later on in the sweater. So uh, as you guys know, I use the uh, rustic 
uh, Heather Sport, the Lycan and Lace for this sweater. And I can tell you this sweater yarn is pretty great. It is really strong. I'm giving it the pull test here. Not a problem. This singles is almost a little bit felted. Right, and that does make a difference. Plus, the composition of this yarn is such that it's made up of 100% wool out of like a wool pool. We don't know exactly what kind of wool goes in here. It might have a little merino, but it feels like it has some medium wools in there, maybe some long wools, which would create a little bit of this kind of luster and sheen um, when you dye it. It's not just a completely matte um, dye job on this on this um, yarn. So we're thinking about uh, composition and we're thinking about whether or not the singles is kind of strong and tough uh, as you go into things. What I will contrast it with is a two-ply yarn, two different two-ply yarns from Bro Brooklyn Tweed. One is Loft, which I've worked with for a couple of different projects now, and we talked about this on an earlier cast. Uh, this was for this flight sweater by Sarah Pope. It is a two-ply woolen spun yarn. And when you get into woolen spun yarns, uh, one of the things you want to pay attention to, uh, the difference between woolen and worsted. Worsted, the fibers are aligned, usually through a combing kind of process, a combed top turned into yarn. Very strong, a little bit heavier, denser kind of yarn. A woolen yarn is carded, so all the fibers are kind of moving in different directions, and then when you spin it, you're basically trapping a lot more air in that um, yarn. So you produce a much lighter yarn, but it's not always as strong as a worsted where you've got all the fibers going in a single direction. So this is the Brooklyn Tweed Loft. If I give it a little pull, it just pops apart. Uh, and this is a two-ply yarn. So this whole idea that working with a singles is going to be this kind of uh, horrible thing is just not true. I mean, it's you're going to find a breakable yarn in numbers of plies. Sure, if you have more, more, more plies, less breakable and less chance of damage. So if uh, one of these stitches were to get snagged on something and break, sure, I don't have the second or third or fourth ply to kind of hold the sweater together. I would need to mend it sooner in order to catch that snag um, so that it didn't, you know, rip out any more of the sweater. Sure. But at the same time, this is a very strong yarn, stronger than a two-ply woolen yarn. And like I said, the woolen yarn was used in the flight sweater by Sarah Pope, which I talked about a few episodes back. You can see that it's beautiful. It produces this gorgeous um, color blending and a little bit of texture in there. Beautiful yarn, but I just wanted to dispel the, the uh, assumption that only singles yarns are kind of fragile or might need some extra care. Uh, you could also look at something like Brooklyn Tweed's Shelter, which I used to knit up my Reverb cardigan. Again, two-ply yarn, and if you pull out the ball of yarn and look at it, it has two plies. It is also a little bit felty feeling, but if you put pressure on it, it falls right apart, right? Uh, so you're, when you're thinking about that idea or that assumption that singles is the only fragile yarn, you want to think about woolen spun yarns, even if they're plied, can be far more fragile than uh, a singles. All right, one of the other assumptions is that singles yarns are going to bias all the time, that they're unbalanced yarns. Now, that is partially true. It just depends on the yarn, once again. A singles yarn has been spun and twisted in a single direction and it hasn't had any plying that will then balance that energy with another strand of yarn, right? So you, you do have more energy going in one direction with a, pl a single ply, a singles yarn, than you would in a multi-ply yarn. Now that matters, for instance, uh, in, uh, depending on what garment you're knitting, you might end up with a little biasing. And this sweater... When I put this sweater on, this is Merig by um, LB Handknits, and I knit it up in a singles kind of cashmere yarn. Uh, and if I put this sweater on, you'll see that it kind of swings just a little bit to one side by the time you get down to the, the hemline around, the, um, around my hips. And that's because this is a slightly unbalanced 
uh, single ply yarn and it produces just enough bias because it has that energy to kind of move the whole sweater just a little bit when you're wearing it. Now in a sweater like this it's gorgeous because it produces you know it's part of the drape it's part of the sweater was is not a really structural sweater it's much more of a drapey kind of sweater so that kind of movement is fine for this design right uh, but in terms of this particular yarn also a singles you have a huge gauge swatch here <laughs> and it's not moving. You can't see any bias in the way that the, the garment is hanging, the way that it's knitted, the way that it sits on your body. It's just actually, even if it's not fully balanced um, because it is a singles, it doesn't have that bias factor that some people worry about with a singles yarn. So that's assumption number two, I guess. Uh, and uh, number three is that this stuff is going to wear rather badly, right? That uh, you're, you're going to get more pilling with a singles yarn that, especially in high friction areas, um, like under the arms and things like that, you might get more pilling. Okay, sure. Any high friction area pretty much with um, wool is going to produce a little bit of wear and tear. So, for example, I have one of my favorite alias sweaters here. This is my cardigan that I wear all the time. It is knit in um, IL Yarns DK, which is a long wool yarn. And you'd think with a long wool, you're not going to get as much pilling. It's not going to be fragile, all that kind of stuff wear-wise. And it is. Overall, the body of this sweater looks like the day I knitted it. It is pretty incredibly unpilled and everything like that. But if you look in the armpits, See that? Let's see if you can see it. Hopefully you can. Uh, I'm starting to get some felting and some little bits of pilling going on there. So even a long wool, even a long wool will produce pilling in certain friction areas. So yes, you're at a little potentially more risk for something like that with a singles yarn, but you're going to find it all over the place. Let me pull out a woolen sweater that I knit up. I love this one. This is one of my favorites. Uh, really fits incredibly well. Uh, this is, uh, this was knit up in a woolen spun yarn. And just have a look. We're not just talking about armpits here. I think you'll be able to see the fuzz. I haven't washed this sweater uh, after the season and I haven't de-fuzzed it. So you can see all of the pilling that has happened here. And this is a woolen spun yarn. It doesn't mean that the sweater is uh, in danger. It doesn't mean that it's not going to be just fine for next season. I'm going to wash it. I'm going to give it a little scratch with my sweater anti-pilling device and get these kinds of pills off of here. I'm not going to just pull them because then they might rip and pull things. Um, but this is a woolen spun yarn and it's multiplied, but you know, it also has that certain kind of pill to it because it's a merino based yarn and merino based yarn just has more pilling as those little shorter fibers work their way out. Uh, and create those pills. So if that's assumption number, what are we on? Number three <laughs> is that it's going to wear out and pill if it's a singles yarn. Not necessarily the case. Uh, assumption number four might be that it's just not for outerwear. That singles are great for things like shawls. And they are. This is the uh, Rebel 2 uh, by Knit Graffiti. Love this shawl. I've worn it quite a bit. It's knit out of a singles, two singles, Madeline Tosh um, singles. And you can see there's not really any wear or tear on this. But again, shawl, you know, shawls kind of distribute the wear depending on how you're wearing it and how you're styling it. But the assumption is that maybe you need to only use single ply yarns for things like shawls rather than sweaters. Well, most of you guys know let Lopi yarn <laughs> is one of those singles that is actually, this yarn is really designed for like outerwear. Like you would want to wear a sweater knit up in this outside, you know, against the elements and it would last forever, right? So let me show you, um, this is the Hopi sweater by Lincoln Newman that I talked about a few episodes ago. And you can see the hairiness of this, I think. The kind of texture, the kind of glowy halo there, maybe. So let Lopi yarn. Lopi yarn is Icelandic wool uh, and Icelandic sheep have a pretty interesting dual double coat. So they have the outside layer that's very hairy and kind of water resistant. They have the inner 
part of it, it's like the thog and the thel, and I always forget which one is which, but one is the outer kind of hairy layer and the other is the downy inner layer. And when you make a loop of yarn, you're kind of spinning those two things together uh, in a single ply. And this stuff is some of the best outerwear you can knit for yourself. <laughs> I mean, this stuff will last forever. And it doesn't, I can tell you, this sweater I knit for myself. I knit uh, Tink, our dog, a dog sweater out of Lopi yarn, and she wore it every day last winter. Like mud puddles, we take walks every day for like five miles a day. That sweater is in perfect condition. It did not tear, did not catch, did not rip, did not felt, did not anything. It's just, it, it looks like the day I knitted it. It's kind of amazing. Uh, so, and I knit Millie one too, and hers is just as good. So this is the Let Lopi Singles yarn, and it is intended for outerwear. <laughs> it's like, because it, the fiber composition is such that you're using a, a sh fiber from a sheep that is intended to have this kind of outer coat to, to get away moisture. Now, most wool, it's 100% wool, is going to be water resistant to a certain extent. This, uh, especially if it has lan lanolin still left in it, but this particular lopey yarn is tough for outerwear and really, really wonderful. And you can see that because it is a singles, you don't have as much stitch definition in the color work. You get a little more blending going on, especially down here in this part. And that's part of the, the draw for using a singles yarn for some of these color work sweaters is that you get a little bit more of a blended look. Um, to the actual color work. If you want stitch definition, you go maybe with your three ply crisper uh, kind of worsted spun yarn and you'll get a very different stitch definition than you would with a singles. All right, so this sweater, like I said, knit out of a singles. I'm very happy with the the non-bias, the balance of the whole thing. I'm happy with the wear and tear. I'm happy with the way that the actual yarn knit up and was, you know, the hand feel of it as I was knitting. It wasn't fragile. Uh, I think it will have some wear and tear, just like a woolen spun yarn might, or just like a 100% merino yarn might, uh, in places where there's high friction, like the armpits. But my sense is that this sweater is going to wear pretty well, and overall, like I said, the message here is that this, this kind of questions are more complicated than we might think. It's not so much just like yarn characteristics generalized garment characteristics generalized. It's like you put the two together and there's some interesting synergies that happen and you just have to kind of match up your yarn with your garment. Are you going for drape? Are you going for outerwear? Are you thinking about stitch definition? Are you worried about pilling and wear and tear? And what do you actually like to work with? Because, you know, if you hate working with lopey yarn, you don't want to knit a whole sweater in it. You're not going to enjoy the experience. So. Maybe you go with applied yarn or you go with some other kind of yarn that you really like to work with. All of those things matter and it's a kind of interesting complicated dance about which yarns you use for which sweaters. Uh, never an easy answer, but I hope that in going through some of these uh, assumptions and maybe dispelling them a little bit, uh, you'll be more willing to pick up a singles and try it with your yarn um, the next time you want to knit a sweater. So I have a few sources for you. Uh, if you're interested in reading more, Jillian Moreno has an article out on Modern Knitting Daily that just came out in 2018 about this topic, about ply. Uh, Cynthia McDougall had an article out about knitting with single ply yarn that came out in 2017. Uh, and uh, Alexa Ludman of Tin Can Knits came out with an article just in January of 2021 called Decisions, Decisions, How to Choose the Right Yarn for Your Sweater. So if you're interested in following up, there are a lot of other really great, wonderful experts in the yarn world who are asking these same questions and wondering uh, what's the right yarn for the project. And I would also like to send a shout out to uh, Albina McLaughlin of LB Hand Knits because she was actually one of the first designers who not only encouraged, but sent me yarn to knit a sweater in a singles yarn. And I wrote back to her and was skeptical, like I've never knit a sweater in a singles yarn. Wouldn't you worry about wear and tear and bias and balance and, <laughs> um, you know, the energy of the yarn and, you know, the drape and what if it's going to break? And, and she wrote back and said, it just, it depends. It just depends. <laughs> so thank you, Albina, for giving me my first lesson in singles. I think that's just about the end. I promised uh, photos of the reverb cardigan, so I'll pop those in here at the end. You can check out the photo shoot that we did uh, for that and for the uh, Bogaji shawl, which I also finished thanks to uh, Knit Boop's uh, beautiful free pattern. Yeah, 
So I will see you guys in a couple of weeks, hopefully with a big announcement, everything all wrapped up and tied to the neat bow, and I hope you'll be as excited as I am to hear what's happening in the next stage of this whole thing. All right, see you guys. Have a good, lovely weekend. Take care.